Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm very excited at the crowd that we've attracted. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to encourage you, if possible, to move to the front, just so we can feel that we have a, a quorum of people. So welcome to this. <laughs> welcome to the COP. <laughs> welcome to this listening session on achieving ambitious food system transformation in the context of USAID's new climate strategy. Our purpose today is to listen to you. We really want to get your feedback. My name is Lini Wallenberg, and I'm the co-chair of the BIFED subcommittee on systemic solutions for climate change adaptation and mitigation in agriculture, nutrition, and food systems. And I'll be your moderator for today. Our purpose is to share uh, the interim results of a study that's being uh, done together with TetraTech, being advised by the subcommittee that I mentioned, and, and several um, authors that TetraTech has brought together. Uh, this, the BIFED subcommittee is a 13-member subcommittee that was found that uh, was established in June uh, this year. And I should mention that BIFED stands for the Board for International Food and Agriculture Development, and it is a presidentially appointed committee. So we're very fortunate to be doing this work because it has USAID's ear, and we really want practical suggestions, but we also want ambitious suggestions. Uh, the agenda for today is that we're going to hear first from Dina Esposito, who's the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, or known as RFS at USAID. She also serves as the Feed the Future Deputy Coordinator for Development and USAID's Global Food Crisis Coordinator, so many hats. Uh, two of the study team authors, uh, Tyrone Hall and Richard Charlatan of TetraTech, will then present their results from the study. And then Ishmael Sunga and Tyrone Hall will support a discussion, the actual listening. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dina. Thank you, Dr. Wallenberg, for that introduction, and thank you to the leadership of the subcommittee. I know this all comes on top of your um, day jobs. I also want to thank Ishmael Sunga and the other subcommittee members, the author team, BIFAD, for your service and contributions. It's, it is a lot of extra work, and um, Dr. Wallenberg mentioned that you all have the ear of USAID, and that's true. I'm one of them. I'm here to greet you and to encourage you to please uh, put your thinking caps on and give us your best thinking because um, we're really interested in this study. It was Samantha Power who commissioned it, recognizing um, as she is just completely seized with the global food crisis that we're facing right now and also completely uh, seized with uh, the climate agenda and how those two things intersect. And of course, that's the nature of the topic we're talking about today. I'm also really interested because, as Dr. Wallenberg mentioned, I have this title of Global Food Crisis Coordinator. And um, I know we all are here because we're seized with a global climate crisis. We also have a global food crisis. Um, I used to work in the humanitarian food portfolio area. And back in uh, 2011, the USAID humanitarian assistance arm was feeding somewhere between 40 and 60 million people in need of urgent, life-saving food assistance. That number today is around 200 million people. It is just kind of mind-boggling. And we know also that the number of people who are undernourished are now roughly one in 10. It's, it's basically back to where it was in 2010. We've lost um, you know, a decade or more of, of, uh, of progress. And that comes for a number of reasons that I think you know well. It relates uh, to conflicts around the world. It relates to disrupted supply chains due to COVID, rising fuel, food, and fertilizer prices. But accelerated climate change is absolutely uh, at the top of the list. So this listening session today um, is really about um, saving both people and the planet. Uh, those two things together come together in your work. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more. I do need to say a word about the climate strategy. We are at COP. That strategy guides our whole of gov agency approach towards reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, helping partner countries build resilience to climate change and making our operations 
more climate smart. By 2030, our goal is to achieve six ambitious targets in the areas of mitigation, natural and managed ecosystems, adaptation, finance, country support, and support for critical populations, including women, youth, and other marginalized groups. Climate finance is playing a critical part, uh, and that includes um, a target for galvanizing $150 million billion dollars in climate finance. Um, we need the BIFAD study to both inform our programming and to provide the right recommendations for how we can best marshal climate finance and apply it uh, to help smallholder farmers. So thank you again for your work and I thank you especially to those of you who are here. I know it's a busy day and we are challenged. If you don't get your comments in, I know that Dr. Wallenberg and BIFAD will be interested in, in hearing from you in a quieter moment if you're struggling like I am to hear myself think. So, uh, but with that, I want to turn it back over. So thank you. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Tyrone Hall, a behavior change communications author and TetraTech, and Richard Charlatan, also from TetraTech, Vice President of Operations, as the study co-authors. Thank you, uh, Lenny. Do we have the remote control somewhere? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Lenny. Thanks, uh, Dina, for that great um, introduction. Um, Dina mentioned the, the new USAID uh, climate strategy and the uh, BIFAD um, subcommittee on climate change was really tasked with trying to understand how best USAID could uh, take that strategy forward and achieve its ambitious results. And so that's really what the study team and the subcommittee have been trying to, to work at. I'm going to introduce a few kind of key points about how the team has been pursuing this, and then Tyrone's going to go through some of the preliminary results so that we can have a good discussion about it. And so r really, again, this session is about us listening to you. So as we present, please be thinking about the things that you think we've got right, the things that you think we've got wrong, the things that we think we should think about so that we can really make sure that this, um, uh, this piece of work uh, is as helpful as possible to USAID uh, and its programming. And I think we all know the impact that that can have, especially thinking about how to mainstream climate action across all of USAID's uh, portfolio. Uh, you can access the paper at this QR code. I'll leave that up there for, for a second, and we'll come back to it um, uh, later. Uh, in pursuing the strategy, because climate change affects almost everything uh, that we do, uh, the team really tried to figure out what the right way to approach this was. And so the first thing that we did uh, is building on the USAID climate strategy, we took a climate resilient development pathways approach. So we tried to understand where across uh, USAID's portfolio, uh, across the work of its partners, we could really find opportunities to integrate um, climate change adaptation with low emissions development and sustainable development. So really recognizing the need to make progress on mitigation, uh, adaptation, and all of the other areas that are required to address the climate, the climate crisis. Within that framework, the study team has been looking to try and identify how to support more systemic, transformative approaches to adaptation. Um, and to do that, the team has identified or, or tried to identify a series of priority systems. Where are the systems uh, within the broader food and agriculture system uh, where uh, change is most needed, where there are the biggest opportunities. To look at the barriers for transformation, what's stopping us from making progress there, and how do we move forward? And then maybe most importantly, drill down into the specifics, uh, what we call leverage points. For those of you who are systems thinkers, you'll, you'll love leverage points. Where are the places where, where USAID and its partners can uh, invest, take action, to have the largest and most significant impact uh, today and into the future. Because we don't, we don't have a lot of time to waste, so identifying where we can have impact now at scale is critical. 
and then from that derive uh, where USAID can make interventions to, to achieve those kind of changes. So that's, that's the process that the study team has gone through. Um, and I will pass it over um, to my colleague to present some of the initial findings. Thank you, Richard. So uh, Richard nicely laid out for us how we thought through the study, thinking through the various systems and how we prioritize them moving forward. But I just want to quickly reinforce how we thought through that. So having done the systemic review of the literature, talked with a number of key informants, and really took stock of insights from the BIFED committee and USAID staffers as well. Thank you. We recognize that there are there's a litany of systems that if you took action, you could generate systemic transformations. But of course, you can't work through all of those. So we went through a process of prioritization. And that process of prioritization was based on elicitation from experts. So we're thinking about how do you generate maximum benefits across both mitigation and adaptation that will also yield benefits in terms of SDG outcomes. Remember our framework, our guiding star is the CRD framework that Richard pointed out. So these are our main systems that we identified, production systems, demand and consumption systems, processing and post-processing systems, land tenure and land use systems. But of course, even within these broad systems that we prioritize, there are subsystems that you needed to think through and prioritize as well. Having gone through all of that, we then, here we go. <laughs> we then worked on a set of high potential leverage points. Richard pointed to this. So you've identified your priority systems, but how will you generate movements within these broad systems? And these high potential uh, leverage points that we've identified, what we're thinking about them in this study is to say, they're particularly important because when you take decisive tactical actions with them in mind, you can generate outcomes, large outcomes that are beneficial in multiple systems. And these systems, because they're priority systems, will then yield large outcomes or benefits that are associated with climate resilient development. So they're particularly important for us. And it's a wide range. You'll notice many of them are associated with different systems, some particularly innovative ones around multinational ESG and net zero commitments, the carbon markets possibilities that we've identified as well. Uh, but with all the leverage points in mind, and you've seen a number of them, we obviously can't go through all of them today. But the two that I want to really delve into are first, the one that is particularly important, and it's it's, it's key to ensuring that the inclusive element of the systemic transformation we're working towards with this study in mind uh, is enabled, and that is the empowerment leverage point. Empowerment as itself, we see as an overarching leverage point, but also it's crucial in order to generate the maximum outcomes you want each time you take actions associated with particular leverage points. And it's our starting point because the climate crisis is one that affects indigenous populations, vulnerable peoples of other categories, including women, uh, young people, and other marginalized groups disproportionately, and compounds their pre-existing disadvantages. So all of the actions or recommendations that we make in this study ask quite directly, how can we ensure that as we broaden the tent and as we deliver sort of impacts in, in the agricultural and food system space, that it will benefit substantially people who are at the base of the pyramid, people who are marginalized. And of course, the areas, a key thing to recognize as, you, as I depart from that leverage point into talking about climate finance, is that the study very clearly suggests that empowerment as a leverage point, speaking specifically about women, young people, indigenous populations, isn't just necessary, but it's in almost all cases a necessary precondition to really maximize the actions you're taking associated with almost all of these uh, leverage points that we've identified prior to leverage points. A crucial, crucial, crucial point. And that cuts across finance, access to finance, land rights, land use, access to spaces where decisions are being made, at, at multiple levels, among other things, technology and so forth. 
But the crucial element of finance came up, and I think it's perhaps the most exciting part of the study, because what we've identified as a starting point is uh, in, in agriculture, agriculture on a whole has a huge climate finance gap. Only about 3% of global climate finance goes towards agriculture and agriculture-related sectors. And just about a half of that gets to smallholder farmers. And it, it sounds like a stat you may have heard before, but it's important to reinforce it because the point is to enable inclusivity. And if the gap is really where people who are marginalized are mostly concentrated on the spectrum and that smallholder agriculture, then it's a huge challenge. And most of that really smattering of funds, that's about $10 billion, is public sector monies. So there's a huge opportunity associated with this challenge. And that huge opportunity is how do you mobilize and make readily accessible at scale climate finance that you can leverage through the private sector? We've seen a number of things that you need to do. It's a preponderance. Uh, so we've categorized them in three broad pots. The first is market enablement. The second is pipeline development. And the third is direct capital participation. And what we've outlined is USAID's very unique role, is USAID's very unique role in facilitating the expansion and the building out of these three broad categories that we've identified. In terms of market enablement, of course, the starting point is that you need coherence in terms of the strategies, the policies, and the actual implementation, implementing bodies locally to ensure that there's predictability and there's a pathway to tap the value that exists when you take actions across the mitigation and adaptation spectrum in the agricultural space. But the, the standard segment of things is almost a box check because there are a number of standards exist. The issue is with implementation. USAID is, as we've recommended in the studies, uniquely positioned to be a bridge builder, pulling together these global standards with reference to the local authorities and their needs so that they can localize and operationalize. But as we've thought through that, we've also seen big opportunities associated with carbon markets that could be opened up, especially with the adoption of Article 6. Challenges notwithstanding there, uh, and we've detailed a number of ways where you could mobilize that, pulling on examples, practical examples that point to the possibilities that can be untapped. And then quickly jumping to pipeline development. So sure, you could fix the market enablement, setting up the structures, but what are the relevant, useful, and readily deployable products that are available uh, in the marketplace that would really benefit smallholder farmers, which is where the gap is? There are very few. And so we've outlined a number of ways where USAID could not just de-risk, but help to create the innovative products needed that will be contextually relevant. And what's dominant throughout all of this is how context will shape many of the outcomes and the solutions, potential solutions. And the third is the unique capacity of USAID to use its, its capital, its grant-making capacity to to trigger, to, to create the possibility for next stage actions in the climate finance space, particularly with small scale holders in mind. But in terms of how we view this study and thinking about the next steps, it's really important to think of this study as our initial stock taking of things. So sure, we've pointed to 10 high potential leverage points. We have high confidence in them but these are likely to evolve. They're, they quite likely will, because the next phase, and that's why we need your help today, and the next section will help with that, because the ultimate goal of, of this study, the next stage, is to get to a point where we delve more deeply into the leverage points. What are these big opportunities, and what are the associated specific actions that you will take to maximize the impact and the outcomes? Um, one other thing to be mindful of as you think through what we're sharing and asking for your input on is that as much as we've attempted to fully uh, sort of bridge the gap of the divide between the technical and the sociocultural in this study, we are taking on as a priority for the next step 
a more fulsome examination of the sociocultural elements, the empowerment elements. It's a dominant finding that, of course, and that's why we've moved it from not just a cross-cutting concern when we think about the leverage points, but itself as an overarching leverage point. And as I was saying, a necessary precondition to even untapping the, the benefits you get with these high potential leverage points. So it's, it's huge, a crucial uh, sort of takeaway from that. Uh, so that I'd wrap up there and invite my colleague Ishmael who can walk us through the listening session. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Tyron and uh, Richard, for taking us uh, through both the process and um, the content of um, the study. And just to underscore that this study, these are preliminary results for which we are seeking more advice and support and uh, critique, if you may, and um, in order to strengthen the recommendations. And this is our chance really to input into what we consider as a subcommittee a very important process. Uh, more specifically, um, oh, oh. more specific. Oh. Which one? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. More specifically, as, sub as, a, as the subcommittee, we are looking at um, your input with respect to. Um, the technical aspects of the study, uh, advice on specific interventions, uh, recommendations on particular voices uh, to seek from yourselves, as well as general questions uh, that are emerging that you'd want really to be answered. So I just want to invite the audience and those that are online to please um, provide us with your feedback in whatever way you feel comfortable. And over to the audience here. My colleagues will be taking down the, um, the questions, and I'm sure we are also monitoring the, uh, the chatting function so that we are able to, uh, to accommodate them, perhaps address some of them in the course of these discussions. How about you? Anyone wants to start? Uh, maybe we could take maybe two, three questions at a time. Okay, now, now it works. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lorenzo Bosi, and I'm from the World Food Program. I'm the asset creation team leader uh, in Rome headquarters. Um, I have, I mean, this is extremely interesting, and uh, like in terms of like priority systems, I'm particularly um, happy to see uh, themes like soils and land restorations, which are really critical in this context. As I mean, this is a climate crisis, but it's also an environmental crisis and a land degradation kind of crisis that climate change actually exacerbate. Um, and also like the, the focus on empowerment of, uh, I mean, vulnerable, I su suppose also food insecure communities which are actually like key um, actors in terms of like um, solving our mitigation problems globally. Um, my question, the question that I have, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to read the strategy, is like, um, are you, how do you see like integrating, um, let's say, shocks and response to shocks within the strategy itself? Like, because from, from, from what I gather, I mean, it seems like um, you're, like, the, the strategy is something progressive in a sense, but like, in the context of climate change, in the context of increasing shocks and increasing intensity of shocks, like um, this this pattern is not like uh, unidirectional. Like it can have like huge setbacks. So, like, how do you take that into account? And um, in terms of um, leverage points, um, I don't know. Maybe it was there. I I didn't see that or I I didn't notice. 
like what about land rights which i mean we see as an issue where like uh, I mean, how can you invest in your in your plot of land if you're a small holder, if you're not sure that that land is will actually be yours in next year, five years time, or maybe like uh, um, like your your wife, who if you die, like it will not be able to inherit that plot of land. So it's difficult to create like a long-term adaptation kind of uh, um, perspective. So these were my two points. Thank you. Th Thank you. Two questions, one on shocks and the other on land rights. Uh, maybe we can, we can help them answer it now, or we take one more or two more. Sorry. Okay, let's take these two first, and then um, whilst that we are taking these questions, think of other questions, other issues you want to raise. Over to you, Tyron or Richard. All right. Uh, th thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks, Lorenzo. Great, um, great questions and, and observations. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the one of the really hard things with thinking through uh, leverage points and system series is, is how to take into account uh, how those systems evolve over time. And of course, with uh, climate change and adaptation and climate resilient development pathways, it's all about time. It's all about the decisions we take now that lead us into the future and how we put ourselves on a path to get there, taking into a fact that the climate will be hot, volatile, uh, dangerous, and constantly changing. Um, and so I, I think that's our, our kind of initial thinking, is how to conceive of a climate resilient development pathway that inherently takes into account the shocks and stresses that are going to occur along the way. Like you can't be, you can't achieve the resilient part of the climate resilient development pathway unless the systems that you're working on have the risk management mechanisms, include risk mitigation, anticipate maladaptation, uh, and address some of these issues along along the way. Um, and if we if we ignore if we ignore that, then um, uh, then we can't we can't move forward. So it's it's not enough to think about, for example. Uh, heat tolerant livestock have to take into account how you're going to maintain livestock production through periods of extended drought or floods um, and make sure that those livelihoods can deal with with deeper and longer shocks than than people have experienced before so so that is part of the thinking integrated um, into um, into at least the process thanks Great. thanks Richard. Uh, thank you for the question on land rights. Uh, in the rush of going through all of the study, I probably glossed over it. But one little point that I was making earlier is you can't get to the fundamental changes, and we, we try to consider it at each turn in the study, about every time you try to unblock a specific theme or domain, you must consider uh, the most disadvantaged. And when you think about agriculture and how lands are lands held in different cultures, and that's why I was pointing to how contextual some of these concerns are. So we do consider it, and I think as you think through the litany of things that we pull together, the, the starting point for us in terms of making the recommendations is you have to reform policies and systems and the engagements that you need to drive that. But one of the things that we've learned through the engagements with indigenous populations and other marginalized groups, traditionally marginalized groups, is that there is a, there's greater need to bridge sort of official uh, governmental understandings and response to things like communal land rights, for instance. So building on your point about uh, women's ownership of land and what happens when, you know, in bereavement periods, um, so in some instances, the study doesn't seem to a seek to answer all of those questions because some of them are just bigger than this. But the responsiveness to it and promoting ways of drawing connections that could resp respect some of the existing local frameworks. Uh, so recognizing indigenous knowledge and the indigenous governance systems is something we've stressed extensively. We've talked with a number of indigenous key informants and one of our commitments and why we want to hear from you is how can we reach even more? So it's just not just a sliver of, you know, sort of engagement with that subset. 
Th th thank you very much for those um, answers, uh, reactions. Can we have some more questions? Yes, madam. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Tracy Mitchell with RTI International. I just wanted to comment on two of the um, two of the emerging priority leverage points that you identified. Um, I noted um, low emission livestock is there, and I'm very happy to see that there. But one of the things, um, as as you continue looking into this, that I would ask that you pay particular attention to, is. Um, to achieve low emission livestock, you know, there are a number of things that can be done. I know um, um, RTI just did a, um, we did a baseline and end line of methane production from dairy cattle in Kenya, and we got a 27% reduction in methane intensity. Um, that was um, two years ago. Now this year, so that, that sounds great and, and, and nice, but now this year with the drought, fewer farmers are implementing those practices. Um, and so the issue of what is the resilience of the mitigation measures. Um, you know, we're coming up with these mitigation measures, but I feel like we're, we're, we're kind of assuming that the world will stay the same for the mitigation measures. And, and I think that's a bit of an oversight on our part. And so I would ask, what, look at low emissions livestock, that that's something that you consider. The second thing is around the ag and food systems. Um, very happy to see that there as well. But I'm not sure that de-risking is necessarily the leverage point. Um, something I would ask you to look at that might, in my opinion, be a, a better leverage point would be um, reorienting our systems towards vulnerable groups and nutritious foods in particular. You know, is the food system serving them? Um, I, uh, I fear that if we just look at de-risking, we'll be developing the food systems not for the most vulnerable, not for the most nutritious. Um, so I would just bring that for you to consider as well. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much for that, um, for that comment. They will address it now. I quite like the concept of um, the resilience of uh, the measures that have been um, um, are proposed, but quite often we speak about the resilience of the people. This is now more about the sustainability of the measures. I think in your presentation, somehow you alluded to some of those, but I'll give it you the chance, please, to go ahead and ask. Thanks. Th thanks, thanks, Tracy. Those were great, um, really great points. And I, I, I think the, the point on the durability of m mitigation measures in agriculture is valid for livestock. I also think it's valid for soil, soil carbon. Uh, it's a little more predictable when you plant a tree, but in soil carbon uh, calculations, it's mostly practice-based. Do you do cover cropping? Do you do no-till? What, what do you do? And the extent to which those practices need to take place every year for there to be a durable emissions reduction is pretty, is pretty critical. So I think that's a, that point is really, uh, really well. Um, taken on the on the de-risking aspect and and nutritious foods. I mean, I think that's a, a really good point. I I think d definitely thinking about um, nutrition, climate smart agriculture, local, lo especially local value chains uh, that that drive sustainable agriculture um, and and improve resilience. That, that that's critical. But I but I do think there's a major um, a major need to kind of de-risk certain elements of agriculture to enable the investment in the change of practices that are required, especially for poor smallholders who don't have um, any way to cover the opportunity cost of transitioning to something else, um, whether that be through things like um, food for assets programs which ensure food security while communities are rehabilitating landscapes in order to have a more sustainable food system or um, uh, using carbon credits to pay the finance gap for coffee farmers who are moving to agroforestry systems. Like th there's many kind of pieces of the puzzle where, where finance is, is required, especially I think for the most vulnerable who, who generally face an adaptation deficit. They can't deal with their current level of climate risk. Uh, never mind what's coming. So trying to help them 
just get to the point where they can start to think about adapting is pretty, pretty essential. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you on the importance of being careful about how we approach the point around de-risking, because again, the, the aim is to ultimately serve the interests of the most uh, disadvantaged and generally marginalized. Uh, so it's a really good point of caution. What I'd also, uh, what, what your point is also revealing, I think, on the life, with, around the lifestyle examples you've shared, is that we also have to be mindful that adaptation recommendations and engagements around that have to be a little bit more self-reflective and, and conscious of the fact that adaptation isn't a permanent state. It isn't an arrival point. It's always going to be re uh, evolving. So as part of the communication of adaptation interventions, we have to be sure, uh, be careful not to set up false expectations in terms of the sturdiness of the interventions and that they will have to evolve. Thank you. So, can we have some more questions, comments, uh, inputs? Yes, Tom. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, Tom Grasso with the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, two, two questions. Um, one, how often does um, the U.S. Uh, I have a thing with microphones today. Um, so Tom Grasso with Environmental Defense Fund. Two questions. Uh, how often does USAID uh, share their learnings with other bilateral I institutions that do similar types of work, and do you learn from them as well? And then I guess secondly, um, and maybe Ishmael, this is um, more specifically for you, how, um, how it, it does USAID engage with their partners on the ground, the farmers and, and others who are um, part of the programs that you work on? And is there somewhere in the report where there's actual reflections from, from those people in frontline communities? Thank you. I'll, I'll pledge it to USID itself. Yeah, sorry, thanks. Hi, thanks for the good question. I'm Ann Vaughn. I'm the Senior Advisor for Climate Change in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Might take, your, take both of the questions together and use just one example. Um, so USAID uh, endorsed the principles for locally led adaptation at last year's COP that lays out eight principles that we're supposed to be doing to make sure that more funding gets to farmers, fishers, um, communities that are most impacted by climate change. Um, and have spent the, the last year working on implementing that, but also the administ administrator power has really pushed the agency to embrace localization so that we are have commitments now to look at co-designing with communities, 50% of our programs by 2030, and I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's, I think, 25% more funding with to local organizations in the next couple of years. So it's 25% in two or three years. But that the co-creation, to your last point, I think is really important because that means we have to be listening. And something that we're exploring in our Bureau for Resilience and Food Security is really how do you co-create and have a feedback loop so we're hearing from communities and feeding that back into program design. Um, so I think we're taking it seriously. We, um, and then just, again, using the example of the locally led um, adaptation principles, we just met with other donors and are trying to promote other donors to take on these principles too. So that's sort of broadly in the climate space. Um, and then the coordination around programmatic examples have happened um, sometimes at the G7 level, but like when you get into technical working groups. Um, but probably uh, COP is a good place for that too, I think for some learning at technical levels too. Um, and through partnerships like Risk-Informed Early Action Partnership that the UK has helped lead to help get our early warning systems, including for smallholders, um, is a good space. And then when we co-fund things together, we learn a lot from each other too. Thank, thank you for that um, reaction. Can we have one or two? Yes, please. We might, have, we might be able to squeeze one last one after her, but let's see. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name's Yolanda Wright. I work um, for Save the Children, um, and I just want to appreciate your work you've done, and, and thank you so much for having a big emphasis on people who are more disengaged, you know, disempowered, disengaged, etc. Um, I had a couple of quite specific questions. One is, I was listening to a great podcast recently with FAO on the use of social protection to complement ag support, to um, enable exactly what you were talking about, the low-income household have least financial cap capability to, to change their 
modalities of working. Coping day to day and not so able to look at, you know, varying their, their um, agricultural choices and also who have more behavioral constraints, right? You were talking about behavior change. So have you looked at how you might complement agricultural, these agricultural uh, leverage points with a sort of longer term social protection system for the more vulnerable households? And the second thing I wanted to pick up on, what my colleague said about nutritional value. We're, we're sort of facing such a global hunger crisis at the moment that we've, many of us have never seen in our lifetimes. How much um, are you focusing on, you know, ensuring it's not just calories, but it's a nutritional calorie uh, kind of component for households? Because it may not be so, um, it may not be so easy, but it could potentially link up with this kind of more resilient agriculture systems, the intercropping, agroecology, etc., that can actually potentially also provide a more nutritious, um, you know, diet for, for local communities. Thank you. Th th thank you very much for that question. Um, if you can do that in three minutes, that would be great so that Lini would come in and sum up. Thanks. Okay, th thanks. Thanks for those great questions. Um, we, we have talked about social protection. I, I think maybe it's a good suggestion to, to think through how to, how to strengthen that and, and integrate it more. I mean, Definitely, we're seeing a ton of really interesting work, particularly around shock responsive social protection systems as a way to make sure that households have predictable um, income. And that, 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 that's really yeah, key. Uh, FAO has done some great work on the importance of predictability and social cash transfers for, for improving uh, agricultural production uh, improvements of, of poor smallholders. Um, and making sure that those systems can can increase the number of beneficiaries or the entitlements to, to households during shocks to help them cope with those shocks. Those those are essential, and they and I, I think it, it it comes down to some really key household decisions that that households make. Like, do I have my kids work on my farm or send them to school? They're so critical to to enabling households not not just to kind of get through the seasonal cycle. Uh, every year, but also invest in adaptation in, in, in the long run. So that, that investment in social protection is not just about n now, it's about protecting the human capacity for, uh, for the next generation. Um, and, and there's many, many other examples out there that we've, we've looked at of USAID partners integrating things like social protection with agricultural insurance um, or livestock insurance to, to try and help uh, those households manage those um, those risks on the on the calorie side, yes, n definitely not just kilocalories. Um, and I think you know that's that's been a big focus of USAID's work and Feed the Future's work uh, since it uh, since it's uh, started. And so th thinking through how to have um, diverse, uh, regenerative, sustainable local food systems is pretty pretty critical. But I do just want to make a plug for uh, staple cereal calories, <laughs> because um, you know cereal cereal crops are some of the crops that are well. Obviously, they produce most of our calories, but they're at most risk uh, from climate change for reduced yields, and not just reduced yields, but reduced micronutrient content in basic cereals. Uh, crops like millet, sorghum, maize, and rice under heat stress produce less zinc, less, I mean, all, all, kinds of, all kinds of micronutrient uh, deficiencies too. So in areas that are cereal dependent for micronutrients as well as macronutrients, like that, that is an even bigger, bigger issue. And, and, and especially where those crops are moving up slope like TAF in, in Ethiopia. So there's lots of things to consider there in how we're going to transform our food system to provide the macro and the micro nutrients to meet meat needs and, and of course protein uh, th thank, 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 thank you very much um, audience for the insights for the questions and for the input and thanks um, Richard and Tyrone for fielding the questions uh, I hand over to Lini Thank, thank you, Ishmael, Tyrone, and Richard. I'm sorry that we have to end. It's a short session. I wish we could have had more questions. I want to let you know that the um, study will be completed by about June. We'll have at least one more public 
session to get input, so you still have an opportunity to influence the results. Uh, if you would like to provide any additional feedback, you may contact Clara Cohen, who's the BIFAD Executive Director, or Carmen Benson, who is the BIFAD Senior Counselor, and their emails are here. Their emails are somewhere. I see one over there and one over here. Uh, and, and the QR code for the report is uh, right there. So we really appreciate your feedback today. Thank you for the excellent questions, and have a good night. Thank you.